Hi everyone, welcome to Women in Data Science Amsterdam. We are so excited to have you here today. And uh, yeah, we're, we're also very excited to, to share with you our excellent lineup on medical data science. So today's event is supported by Amsterdam Data Science, a network organization uh, in the fields of AI and data science in the Amsterdam region, um, bringing together academia, industry, and society. Um, also Amsterdam Medical Data Science, which is a sister organization of ours. Uh, and uh, they focus, of course, on medical data science, as you can guess from the title. Um, and of course, Smart Health Amsterdam, which is for um, a, a department part of the Amsterdam Economic Board. Um, we're really happy to, to be working with them to reach you all now. Um, and yeah, we, we, uh, we hope that you enjoy this event. And this event is sponsored by the University of Amsterdam um, and their Grassroots Science for All uh, initiative, which, is, uh, which aims to promote diversity and inclusiveness within the Faculty of Science. Um, I, myself, uh, uh, am employed by the University of Amsterdam, so I'm glad that we can bring them all on board. Um, and I also work for Amsterdam Data Science. Uh, and I'm the WIDS Amsterdam ambassador um, for the WIDS initiative. So a little bit about Women in Data Science. Uh, it's an initiative that was started by Stanford University uh, about five years ago now. Um, it's a conference with more than 150 regional events worldwide. Um, and yeah, they, they have a datathon every year. Uh, Maastricht University uh, actually took part in the datathon and we hope to do so next year. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, as you'll see from the next slide, they, there's events all over the world, um, starting from March, going all the way until June. Um, and we actually started this with uh, um, Maastricht University, Pippel and Yads, um, to present the Women in Netherlands event, uh, Women in Data Science Netherlands event, uh, which took place on the 8th of March. And this is a follow-up regional event. Um, so here is a nice view of all the uh, locations across the world that WIDS uh, took place in. We have a very exciting program for you today uh, with two keynote speakers, one from academia, one from industry. And also we have provided some time for two postdocs to share their research uh, during the postdoc pitches. And we hope that you as the audience will uh, join us to be a little bit more interactive about sharing your experiences um, and maybe some uh, challenges or, or solutions to, to other people's challenges during the breakout sessions uh, a little bit later today. For now, I would like to invite uh, the ADS director, Linda Hardman, onto the stage. I'll do so right now. Um, and she will talk to you a little bit about um, Amsterdam and uh, yeah, how, how Amsterdam is really getting into the depths of health and data science and AI. So Linda, please do take it away. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeanne. So as Jeanne said, I'm the current director of Amsterdam Data Science, um, but I have paid jobs as well. I'm the manager of research and strategy at CWI, the Center for Mathematics and Computer Science, a national research center, one of the NWI institutes in the Netherlands. And I'm also professor of multimedia discourse interaction at Utrecht University. Um, just to let you know a little bit about who is the director of Ansem Data Science. So in the past, I've worked for at least one large company. It was a large company in Edinburgh in Scotland. And this was at the beginning when we were going from mainframe computers to desktop computers. Can you even imagine? And I've also worked for a couple of startups and four different universities I worked out today, plus Utrecht, so actually five universities plus Utrecht. Um, I've been a co-founder of a Dutch startup. Unfortunately, it didn't survive being a startup, but you know, it's nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I even do some research. So I'm currently supervising a PhD and some master students. And my research interests are very data science and AI oriented. We are looking to explore, in our case, neuroscience literature using concepts. So rather than using just the words, 
uh, using analyses of corpora to come up with the concepts in neuroscience and then how we can visualize these in augmented reality to allow neuroscientists understand their own field more easily through interaction with it. We almost have a prototype system. So if you're interested, drop me a line. Um, and this brings me actually to health and data science on and AI. In Amsterdam and in fact in the Netherlands, there's a lot of work in the Netherlands on health and medical applications using AI and data science. And in Amsterdam in particular, we have two universities uh, plus the University of Applied Sciences. We have the Joint University Medical Center. And of course, we have CWI and all of these organizations are doing fundamental and applied research on AI and data science for health. There's also the Amsterdam Medical Data Science Organization. So if you are affiliated more with the medical people than with the data science people, then we can put you in touch with the Amsterdam Medical Data Science Organization, one of our sister organizations. And today we are not only having some excellent talks, but we're also promoting our speakers who are talking for us today. And I'm very happy that this is a way of not only promoting our today's speakers, but for allowing other people to see the types of careers that women can follow in academia, in the company life. And indeed, if you are interested with one of the other, um, some data science is here to help you connect up. If you're still studying, if you're doing a PhD and you're wondering, you know, what are the next steps? Then the whole point of our organization is to allow you to find the people you'd like to talk to, to think about your next steps in your career. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea over who I am, how Amsterdam Data Science can help you. And I really hope that you enjoy today's presentations. I'm really looking forward to them. Thank you very much. Right. So our first speaker is our academic keynote. Uh, Clarissa Sanchez is full professor in AI and health in the Informatics Institute and the University Medical Center Amsterdam, both within the University of Amsterdam. Together with Professor Ivana Igsen, she leads the Quantitative Healthcare Analysis Group, an interfaculty group focused on the development, validation, and clinical integration of socially responsible AI solutions in healthcare. She's also scientific director of two EKI labs, Theralab and AI and Oncology Lab. In her talk today, Clarissa will present how deep learning is transforming healthcare from detection and diagnosis to treatment monitoring. She will further discuss the challenges that we are currently facing and the need for new approaches to accomplish clinically meaningful solutions that will be integrated or can be integrated in clinical practice. Uh, just a note for everyone watching, there will be time for questions at the end of Clarissa's talk, and uh, I'd like to direct you to the Q&A function on the right of your screen, if my left and right is correct. Um, yes, so please ask your questions there, and I will read them out for Clarissa to answer. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Clarissa onto the stage. No. So, well, thank you very much for the introduction and also uh, I'm very happy to present in this uh, uh, initiative. I mean, I think it's a wonderful initiative. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to present AI and healthcare going beyond the hype. And before going into details about it, I want to introduce a bit the group, uh, uh, Quantitative Healthcare Analysis Group, although journal already introduced it, but especially because then you are going to understand exactly what I want to go with this going beyond the hype. Um, uh, so, well, as I mentioned, the uh, QRI, the Quantitative uh, Healthcare Analysis Group, is an interfaculty group between two faculties, the Faculty of Medicine at the uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center and the Faculty of Science, both in the University of Amsterdam. And uh, we focus together, uh, Ivana is one and I, uh, on the development, validation, a clinical integration of social responsible AI solutions in healthcare. Uh, just as an overview of the topics that we usually uh, handle or we address in this uh, group, uh, we focus, of course, on uh, patient care and then we tackle different uh, steps in the uh, pathway of the patient from prevention, diagnosis and treatment. And uh, we address uh, cardiovascular diseases and these are a sample of two um, projects that we are now uh, doing in the, in the lab. In the group, uh, for example, the prediction of uh, uh, cardiovascular events in breast cancer patients or the assessment of uh, deterioration in uh, non hospitalized heart, uh, heart failure uh, patients. Also, we have uh, a research line focusing on eye diseases, 
uh, going from the screening and diagnosis of main eye diseases to the uh, making a treatment decision using AI with a combination of different biomarkers, bi medical imaging biomarkers and uh, other biomarkers, for example, genetic biomarkers. Uh, we also have a, a, a focus on neurodegenerative diseases, and this is one of the current uh, projects that we have uh, focusing on the detection, early detection of Alzheimer using retinal images, or also in gastrointestinal diseases uh, going from the screening uh, with polyp detection and characterization, or the diagnosis of pathological images. And also, as mentioned, we also focus on oncology and cancer. And this is within the ECAI lab, AI in Oncology lab, that is together with the National Cancer Institute. And one of the pro, uh, projects that we will uh, address there uh, is, for example, uh, to see which patients progress into invasive breast cancer. So as you can see, there are many things that we are doing already within the group and different diseases and different stages. And it's, it is a fact that AI is being, uh, being applied in different steps of the, of the patient healthcare. Starting, for example, uh, at the beginning when those patients are not even patients, so uh, that they, we uh, use a wearable, so personalized app to prevent and manage health conditions. And then going all the way, for example, when we arrive to the GP, and then we have virtual health assistance to support general practitioners, or when we enter already in the hospital, um, to support specialists in the reading of uh, lab results or imaging or uh, other tests, uh, uh, medical tests, to robotics for interventions, or to personalize up for the support of patients during the rehabilitations, also for treatment analysis or treatment monitoring, remote monitoring. So taking into account that this has been integrated in different steps, it makes also sense that in the last year we have seen a very large increase of the publications that have been done in the field. This is just an example of the publications done in medical images. That is one of the main focus of our, our lab. And you can see that there has been an exponential increase in the last year. However, if we look not only on the research part, but we also look into what it has been uh, applied in medical practice, we have to check for those uh, all solutions that have been certified. And uh, in a recent publication, they show that this is, of course, this is also a trend. It's, it's increasing the number of uh, FDA or CE mark approved AI solutions uh, in the last year, but it's not in the same pace as, for example, as the publications that are being done there. And if we also look in the right part, uh, we see that the, the most of the publications of most, so most of these devices are uh, especially in some of the fields, for example, radiology. And now in other fields uh, that are only few of them. So if we look at this, we can see that the research and uh, all the we can say solutions that we create in the research field or in the research arena is, is slowly getting into patient care. And if we go even beyond that, it says like okay, now the solutions are patient care, they are certified, and uh, we look at the, how it's being used in clinical practice. There was a survey from uh, uh, the American College of, Hospital of Radiology in asking radiologists, okay, do you use AI and uh, how do you use it and, uh, how, um, and uh, where do you use it? And the, so the results of this survey show that 69% of all the radiologists interviews, uh, they don't use uh, AI and the reason was because they don't see the benefit of it. And also of the 23 that they use it for clinical care, there was a 93% that indicated that they are, the accuracy is inconsistent and 2% that it never works. So this is quite um, scary. Well, it's a bit also uh, frustrating seeing that we put a lot of effort created, a lot of solution and at the end it's not being used because, or it's being used, but it's not accurate enough or it's inconsistent or it's not even used. So we need to uh, reflect what we are doing, Ron, and how we can solve it. So one of the things that is maybe for uh, address the, the, the problems of uh, uh, that is not uh, accurate enough or is inconsistent is if we look at the evaluation. And uh, what we have seen is have been several studies showing that the evaluation that is being done for these uh, models, for those ones that have been published, uh, there is not enough or is not uh, uh, sufficient to, to really indicate that this is a clinical, ready to use uh, clinical device.
For example, in a review of 516 published uh, studies so in 2018, only 31 of those uh, performed independent validation. And if we look in even a larger study where they uh, review uh, more than 31,000 uh, studies, they show that only 25 of them perform an external validation. And even they are not compared with uh, uh, observers. So we can think, okay, maybe this is because this is the research phase and of course it can be pilot studies that they don't perform. But still, if we look into uh, FDA approved medical devices, this is a publication of uh, like uh, one uh, week or two weeks ago, uh, we can see that uh, only four, uh, I don't know if you see my mouse, but uh, well, only four of the uh, studies and a circle on red are prospective studies. So they are, are been, this device has been uh, uh, evaluated using a prospective study, only four of the 130. And then 37 out of those ones uh, in blue, uh, they are being tested in a multi-site uh, analysis. So that's something that we, of course, need to uh, work on. But as, as a researcher, we can think, okay, this is part of evaluation. This may be, have to be done also further after we do our research. But it's not only there, because uh, if we want to address uh, those radiologists that indicated, uh, for example, that they don't see the benefit, the benefit of the model, we also have to look into the, into the design. And if we look into the design, I came to this paper, also published not so long ago, and this make an analysis of a review of uh, uh, papers that were published in the last year for uh, COVID-19 detection and prognostication using chest radiograph and CT scan. And it was a survey between 1st of January 2020 and 3rd of October 2020. And of the 2,212 uh, studies, of only uh, 415 were included after initial study. And after a quality screening, 62 were included. And what they uh, concluded is that none of these models uh, identify out of potential clinical use due to methodological flaws and underlying bias. And I will read further. The reason why, why these uh, models are not currently ready for deployment are uh, the bias in a small data set, so data set used for uh, development and validation, the viability of large international sources data sets, so again, a problem with the data, the poor integration of multi-stream data, particularly in image, uh, imaging data. Then the fourth one is the difficulty of the task of, prognosti of prognostication. This is inherent to the task that we want to solve. But especially what I interested me in a lot was the fifth one, and it was the necessity for clinicians and data analysts to work side by side to ensure the developer algorithm are clinical relevant and implemented, implementable in routine clinical practice. And this is, the, I think, the problem that it comes when then the radiologists need to use it, for example, and then of course see that they haven't worked side by side, and then the solution is not clinical relevant from them. So if we want to go beyond the hype of AI uh, for healthcare and just publishing papers in this field, we have to go also beyond the uh, normal uh, ingredients that are being used for this problem, that it could be a curated data set, and I'm talking here about curated, but it can be even uh, worse than that, computational power, of course, and an algorithm. And uh, we also have to go beyond uh, the typical uh, directions or uh, approaches that we follow to create the models, like it's just mix, fake, and try. So to go beyond, we also take into account for this uh, AI in healthcare solution, we have to take into account domain knowledge. Domain knowledge is very important, not only um, uh, to create, uh, well, to evaluate these, uh, these solutions, but also to make something that is meaningful for the doctors and that they are uh, see the benefit of using. But also we have to look into the clinical work workflow and we have to understand how this solution will be integrated because uh, the ecosystem, the clinical ecosystem is very complex and it's very difficult uh, to address all the things that can happen in that uh, in those workflow uh, without knowing about it. And of course, we also have to take into account regulations related to the device, related to the uh, disease, related to other things. And for the directions, of course, we have to go also beyond mix, fake, and try. We have to try even more, and we have to assess it properly in a proper evaluation to understand 
if the accuracy is uh, clearly uh, the one that is expected from this kind of model in clinical practice. So uh, this is a complex recipe. And usually what we have been doing, of course, we, we, we are uh, doing just, we can say with three ingredients and a small direction, a researcher took the load. But now we have to involve in the recipe, everybody from the beginning, everybody needs to cook here, not only AI researchers, but also the medical especially, even patients need to be here involved, and also companies and a regulatory bodies. So in order to create something that is beyond the hype, the hype and is responsible and clinical meaningful AI solution for healthcare, we have to aim to co-develop and co-evaluate these solutions together uh, with the main stakeholders and taking into account different other uh, ingredients or uh, information and needs to be solved. So I want to present here a use case. Uh, this is research that we have uh, been done, and I, this was done in last year, so it was also when I uh, uh, was also in a different group, but it was done together with uh, people from uh, uh, national effort. And it's CT analysis using AI during COVID-19 crisis. And I would like to explain you exactly the reason be behind it. So um, let's start with the role of chest imaging during COVID-19. So during uh, that time, and one of the most important societies in radiology, uh, they indicated what could be the role of chest imaging in the patient management. And two of the main recommendations indicating that images, uh, imaging is not indicated as a screening test for patients with asymptomatic individuals or even with patients with mild features of COVID. So a solution that just screen patients, like say a normal, normal at that level of patients that are, for example, that they, uh, like a PCR test that we will try to do, that's not going to be, it's not recommended. So yeah, we already have a hint here how our solution should be. Additionally, we look at the current workflow on that time, the current workflow at that time in the hospitals that uh, we were uh, working with. And uh, what we saw, and uh, we were told, of course, is that the patients with symptoms fitting COVID-19, so severe symptoms, they show up at the emergency ward. And at that moment, they were limiting tested capabilities to perform PCR tests. And if they were performed, they took a, a long time to, to, to get the result. So there was a problem. Patients were arriving and doctors needed to make a decision at the emergency ward. And it was very difficult to make the decision and were unknown. Uh, and uh, there was decisions about, for example, can I put this patient in a room together with another patient that doesn't have COVID? Can I uh, need isolation about for this patient and the rest of the, the, the people around it? Or do I need to connect this pa pa patient immediately to a respiratory equipment? So then, in that moment, radiology started using CT scans of those patients. So the role of the low, low dose CT in this case, uh, as it was used, was first to assess the suspicious for COVID-19 in this uh, kind of uh, patients, or hospitalized us with the uh, clinical signs of, uh, of COVID-19, assess also the severity of the infection, based on the percentage of affected lung parenchyma, this makes a decision of how to continue what the treatment has to be. Also assess the stage of the disease based on typical partners, patterns, sorry, and assess comorbidities and provide an alternative diagnosis in case that the patient, of course, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, COVID-19. So we especially focus in these two, in the assessment of suspicion for COVID-19, and also an assessment of the severity of infection based on the percentage, because it's the first step that the doctors uh, uh, done to, me to uh, we can say, handle or manage this patient. But again, we can adjust to, uh, we can say, uh, classification or uh, uh, architecture or a classification model where we say, okay, this patient is suspicious for COVID-19 or not, because that couldn't be of use. And the reason is because Radiologists work with the structured reporting. Structured reporting means they, they, they read a CT and they report the different things in a structured way. And during COVID-19, uh, again, uh, um, 
this was endorsed by the Society of Thoracic Radiology, the American College of Radiology and ICNS, so like a very important group of experts. They indicated that this uh, cognitive should be uh, reported following a structure reporting because this can help radiologists recognize the finding. It can decrease reporting variability. It can reduce uncertainty in reporting and also can enhance the referring, uh, provided understanding, so also for communication with other uh, clinicians. Uh, and this can be allow a better integration in the clinical uh, decision making. So uh, there was already, it was more than just say this patient is suspect or not, it has to be followed uh, in a, this has to be reported in a very specific way. And last year, uh, radiologists uh, from, the, from the Netherlands, uh, propose a scheme, a standardized reporting scheme for uh, chest CT in patients suspected of COVID-19. And this report has two things. So then uh, we have CORATS score, and this CORATS score uh, measure the level of suspicions for pulmonary involvement in COVID-19. And then they have the severity, CT severity score that is uh, give the percentage of affected lung parenchyma. So if we, we go, so then every time that they uh, have to report or have to uh, um, read uh, uh, one city for COVID, for COVID, they have to follow, they have to provide these two scores. And for the COVID score, this is a score that goes from zero to six. So zero is not interpretable, but then goes to one that is a normal of uh, non-infection. So the suspicious is very low. Then go to a suspicion level of uh, low uh, with COVID two, that is difficult for other infections, but not COVID-19. And then is uh, they have a level uh, three when there is uh, there are features for COVID, but there are also other features that they cannot provide a, um, a definitive assessment. And then they have four and five that is high and very high, what is very uh, suspicious for COVID, typical for COVID. The final one is uh, just when the uh, patient also have a PCR positive uh, test. So uh, this is just no one zero one. We can say abnormal suspicion. Uh, or for COVID or not. This is, has more uh, levels. And also for the CT severity score, what they do is just um, they assess a uh, per lobe. A lobe is a unit, a functional unit of the of the lung. We have five lobes. And then they assess a, a percentage of lung parenchyma, so of lung tissue that is affected with abnormalities related to COVID. And then, uh, well, but they, they related to the disease. And then they give a, a, an assessment based on that percentage. They give a point, a zero to five point, and then they have a maximum score of 25. So you can see I spent, I don't know if it was more than five uh, or, or uh, seven minutes talking about just domain knowledge, uh, talking about the regulations, talking about uh, um, uh, clinical workflow in order to understand what could be the solution that we can provide, of course, because we wanted to help, but that this is clinical and meaningful. And we came with this model, a score at CI, and this model what uh, has an input at uh, CT uh, images uh, of the uh, chest, and then uh, give us an output uh, score at the score from one to five, and a severity score from one to 25, uh, from zero to 25 and uh, per lot. And this is a, um, an effort that was done uh, not only by AIR researchers, but also for scientific programmers, um, of course, uh, medical specialists, uh, but also companies. So it was a, a joint effort that we co-designed and co-developed together. So if we go in detail about the model, what it has. Uh, so we first, uh, well, this is the pipeline of the model. So we follow exactly what they also doctors uh, or radiologists read the images. So we first uh, identify the uh, functional units, the lobes, uh, and then based on those one that information, we extract the individual lobes and also create a lesion segmentation in order to provide this CT severity score. And then combining this information, we can also obtain a CORAT score. Yes, let's go a bit more into the method. And it's a bit complex, but uh, I, I will, um, I mean, I, I'm not going to explain all the details here, but just to give you an indication of the um, complexity of the solutions that is behind one solution like this. So first we have the pulmonary lobe segmentation. This is a, also a publication that was done also uh, during, uh, we were developing this 
uh, uh, model, and it was tested not only with uh, patients, uh, COVID patients, but also with patients with other diseases. And this model, what tries to do is, um, well, it's a cascade of the two CNF. And in the first cascade, try to have a course uh, identification of the border of the lobes. And then in the second one, it's a refinement step where you try to really identify the properly or in, uh, in detail that, that, uh, that border. And you can see on the right an example of, um, it's very difficult, maybe it's very difficult to see on the screen, but uh, in the upper part, you see the original. Of course, and then there is a line that is visual uh, for the separation of the, the, the lobes. And then you can see the outputs in the lower part and in color coded the different uh, lobes. After that, we uh, calculated the uh, CT severity score per lobe. And what we did is use one of the state of the art uh, networks. Uh, this is the non new unit that it has uh, first uh, estimate parameters and also the network specifically for this uh, kind of problem. And uh, you can see on the right what is going to be the output. Also, uh, it's color coded per, per lobe because we already have that information. You can see that then from there we can really quantify the percentage of uh, lamprey kina that is affected and we can provide the score. And finally, using the lobe, uh, the lobes uh, information, also using these uh, lesions, um, the segmentation of the lesions, we uh, provide this uh, input together with the original image to an inflated uh, the I3D, inflated 3D uh, networks. And that it uh, provides this input, and then we, as an output, we have a correct uh, score from zero, from one to five, following the same as it was uh, trained in the same way as it was uh, it is done in, uh, in practice. So let me show you just an uh, example. So you, here you can see a patient uh, with uh, COVID-19. This is uh, uh, has been tested with PCR test also, so positive. And in the, uh, you have the original uh, image in the upper part, it's different uh, slides from the same uh, image, from the same volume. And you can see the results in the middle uh, uh, row, you see the results of the lobe segmentation. And in the lower band, you see also the results of the segmentation for the abnormalities. This is also information that is provided to the uh, doctor for assessment. And then we also provide together with that the uh, prediction uh, for CORAT's score, in this case, it uh, has a probability of uh, 89 for CORAT's uh, 5, so that could be the final score. And then you can see that per law, we, can also provide, we also provide um, the severity. Uh, we can see that the right middle lobe is uh, more severe uh, affected uh, than the other lobes, but all of them are quite, uh, quite affected because it's from 0 to 5, and they all of them have a 3 or 4. And this is an example of a uh, healthy, or at least not uh, suspicious for COVID-19. And you can see that, uh, well, the, the lobes in the middle row, you can see in the uh, lower, in the bottom row, you can see uh, that this detects uh, some abnormalities, but also not related to COVID. Uh, and then you can see that the correct uh, prediction here is one, as expected, and you can see also the percentage of affected parenchymia at this uh, uh, very low, or even uh, uh, zero. So we did, of course, an evaluation of this model, uh, and we compared it in order to uh, avoid uh, pitfall in the evaluation. We uh, tested in two different test sets, one internal and one uh, external. And we compared it even in the internal set, we compared it with eight, eight radiologists. And in the external set, we compare it with uh, four radiologists. And we make an analysis, as you can see, the uh, software performs at the same level as the, the radiologists that it is there. You can see also on the right the, um, the performance of the uh, evaluation, estimation of the affected uh, parenchymia compared with the uh, scores of seven readers. Um, what we did also, and I thought uh, that it was a very good idea also to um, uh, to allow to uh, try even further no, in, in our uh, uh, directions for the recipe. We have a mix, bake, and try. But if we want to go beyond, we have to try even further. So we make this algorithm available. You can uh, find it in the, in the link that is provided below. 
And there, uh, the user have the opportunity to upload the scan, uh, to see the result from other scans, but also upload the, their own scans and see the and uh, get processed. For example, where we since we uh, open it up, we receive a lot of uh, requests, and they have been using a lot. And for example, in the last uh, week, we have seen a lot of requests from Brazil when uh, now the uh, COVID incident is quite high there. And you can see that uh, uh, we allow the, the, um, the doctor or the user to scroll through the image so you can see the results of the different step of the algorithm. And then we could provide also uh, the estimation for the correct score and the CT severity score as is shown on the screen. And because this was also developed together with our company, uh, Tirona, the company that also developed with us, uh, commercialized uh, this product. I mean, uh, also modification is not completely the same. Uh, and this is now a CE certified product and is being used in clinical practice in different hospitals in the Netherlands and worldwide. So, as you can see, well, I'm not saying that this is their way to go, but this is, a, a, you can see that there was a long process uh, between uh, we started collecting information and uh, knowing, uh, knowing what is needed and the solution was um, tailored to that need and it was tailored to uh, how the clinical workflow uh, worked at that time and uh, how the, the uh, regulations were in that moment. And because we collaborated together with uh, different people, we saw that it was uh, first was accepted by the medical community, but it was also uh, possible to uh, commercialize it and uh, certify it even further. So, as a take-home message, if we really want to work a clinical relevant AI solution for healthcare, we have to take into account that there are more green, key ingredients and data and algorithms. It's something that maybe data sayers we just look at. And uh, especially in healthcare, domain knowledge is very important for understanding um, well, how this solution needs to be uh, done, or what is needed to understand how the solution needs to be uh, need to be uh, is needed, and how it's going to be used in the practice. And of course, we also have to look at how uh, do we need to validate it further. But additionally, uh, domain knowledge is very essential, not only for the proper evaluation of course of this solution, but also for the design and development. So then we need to use this domain knowledge to avoid that the, when the, uh, our solution finally reach uh, doctors, because they are being certified, the doctors say, well, I don't see any benefit on that. So if we want to create this relevant, uh, clinically relevant uh, solution, we need to already involve all the uh, users at the design level and also at the part of the evaluation. Uh, so we need to co-create and co-validate with many stakeholders. Uh, uh, in that way, we can get, go beyond the hype and really uh, create an impact in, uh, in healthcare and uh, clinical care. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clarissa. That was excellent and very interesting. Um, but I had a, a question myself. Um, so of course, the, the domain knowledge is very important. Um, and do you think that there has been a, more of an urgency because of COVID-19 to integrate this technology into healthcare? Um, yes, of course, uh, there was a need, but what we saw is uh, there was a, how to say, there was a, a need uh, that it was needed to be there. There was a hype, like, hey, let's use AI to solve it. And then there was many publications and many uh, models that they were incorrect. For example, in the, uh, they were, uh, using data sets that it's just they merge two different public data sets. That one was for pediatric uh, patient that doesn't have to do anything with COVID. So then you you see that they get a um, validation of uh, our performance of 0 0.99, but then it's not a proper solution. So there were many pitfalls, and I think that it, it was even worse because there was that urgency. Hmm. So we have to, I think, establish already from the beginning that this is a way to work. And so when we need this urgency, we don't fail uh, providing and we don't make these mistakes uh, at, at that level, of course. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and have you faced any challenges uh, regarding the medical community um, in terms of getting this, uh, not necessarily approved, but just at least uh, taken on board as, as a possible, well, uh, path to, to the future? Well, well, the, the they well for this solution, the one that I presented, they, they, as they were already part of the development, uh, they were more ready to embrace it because they were they were also their solution, so that it was a, a bit more easier. But what we have seen for other developments that we have done, if we are too far away from there and we don't communicate, then they are a bit more. They face more, um, they see more as a strange thing and it's more difficult to them to embrace it. They see also competition, they, they, they don't trust it. So yes. for that reason, it's very important already for all these things to co-develop, uh, not only to validate it together, but co-develop uh, mm. from the beginning. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Julia. Um, is the model you developed for the COVID diagnosing also adjustable for other long disease diagnosis? Um, yeah, for example, there, there are, um, and that was also part of the, what you was done in the company, uh, they, they can expand it to other, it can be expanded to other things and pneumonia or other diseases that are also involved there. And you can see that the role of CT in COVID is also identifying other type of disease, or at least indicating if there is another disease that is not there, what should we do with that? So yes, it can be, it's not uh, there yet, but it's something that it can be incorporated. Yeah, nice. Uh, we have another question from Nidhi. Uh, how big how big data sets you have evaluated, how big have the data sets been that you've evaluated so far? And um, can you give us an example of the sample size? Yeah, the, the data set was uh, small because uh, it was around uh, 400, uh, we can see for a validation uh, internally and also externally it was around uh, that size. Uh, because it was what it was available at that moment. We didn't have, uh, we collected everything that it was available at that moment and uh, as it was developed at the beginning, we didn't have so much. But then after this was uh, done, we have been continuing validating and then we have done um, a larger size, like uh, more than a thousand uh, CT scans for that. Uh, the problem for those validations is also that, of course, we need uh, different annotations, we need different assessments and that's more difficult to obtain and in this set that we have already eight radiologists assessing, so for that we reduce a small one. And the good part also that this was publicly available and the people could use it is that we could also see how the system performed uh, with different type of images from different sites, from different uh, um, uh, indications. So that could, was also very nice and insightful for us to continue develop the algorithm. Uh, we have another question from Sharon. Uh, was the chest CT severity score designed for this project or was it being used before? Yeah, that was used before. So it was, uh, uh, that was, uh, I don't know if I included the, the, the reference there, but these are see, uh, severity scores that are being used in clinical practice. And uh, they, this one was uh, indicated before uh, for also other diseases because it's how it's. Uh, for kind uh, to uh, measure the affected uh, uh, parenchyma tissue. But it was accepted as a part of the uh, CORATS score and that uh, the reporting scheme that it was uh, mentioned at national level. So they have to provide both, both the CORATS score and also the CT severity score. And um, do you have any advice for any data scientists who are looking to further further their careers in the medical data science area? Um, you know, in terms of how do they gain that that domain knowledge, or how do they at least connect to to those who have the domain knowledge to co-create uh, these solutions? Yeah. Well, for example, these kind of events, uh, you can already uh, or, or this community also can help a lot to to, to get the, these connections. I think that is. It's always very nice to try, and I don't say like you have a database downloaded, try and uh, thing, but please also reach out to doctors and then uh, they are very willing to, to and open to discuss further. There are many groups in Amsterdam that is working on different mm -hmm. health uh, related uh, uh, research that they very, will be very willing to do it. So uh, reach out, uh, join these kind of communities because then uh, you can see uh, the ecosystem that is around it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question from Christian. So did you face any problems using data from different X-ray medical devices? Could you tell us about uh, a little bit about how you did it? Yeah, uh, one was, uh, as I said, the evaluation was in one site. 
Uh, so that was the internal. So then we have uh, the, the, the machines that are there. But then we uh, evaluated in different data sets that there was a different, um, we can see, well, we saw that there no problems, but we saw that there was a different uh, performance. But uh, it didn't drop. You can see that the, in the external data set, there was a bit of drop in the accuracy, but it wasn't that drastic that it couldn't be used in clinical practice. Um, so we did in, indeed assess with different uh, type of machines, scans from different machines, from different uh, protocols, scanning protocols, and uh, we see that it's uh, it's a difference, uh, but it's not that, that much that can be used. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a question about the regulation, because of course uh, different organized, well different countries, different uh, groups of countries like the EU have different regulators. Um, is that something that is a difficult barrier to entry in terms of this kind of technology that you have to get it approved by many different regulators which have different criteria? Yeah, of course, there is a big difference between the, for example, C European uh, regulation mm -hmm. practice and also uh, American, for example, FDA, mm -hmm. and if you go to other countries, also the same. Uh, so there is a big difference. So for that reason, it's good as, for example, I don't know everything within the regulation, I'm not an expert in that, to involve them uh, as much as you can in the development, because then you can't get some insight. It's very difficult, of course, to involve them, but uh, if you involve also companies, they are also aware of these regulations, so they also can uh, indicate further and there. Yeah. So we have time for one last question. Uh, we have one from Morteza. Uh, how how is your model? Uh, how does your model separate samples with other lung disorders for patients with COVID? Did you apply your model to these samples with other lung disorders, such as asthma? Yeah, we apply, um, well, I don't know now with asthma, but we apply with, for example, um, pneumonia. That is one of the things that they has similar symptoms. You have to realize that the model is uh, used when patients arrive with symptoms related to COVID, and then you have to differentiate those two. So we have, um, we have uh, made that analysis. Uh, you could see that it, it drops. It's very difficult sometimes even for radiology to make this separation. And I think that we have to further evaluate it, uh, the model to, to uh, really focus on uh, when there are other diseases that can be at the same time coexist and that. So uh, we have the, we made an analysis because we also have a data set, external data sets where they have more, uh, they have patients with also these indications. And uh, we had some problems because the differentiation of the pathologies are not that simple. So we need to work further there. It's not a, a solve uh, problem, not even for reality. So it's a bit uh, difficult still. Yeah. It's not included in the, we can say, in the um, paper that it was published, mm -hmm. because that was only with the data set that we had at that moment. Uh, but it uh, has been done after that. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I see the time and uh, thank you so much, Clarissa, for, for uh, your presentation. We will be sharing your presentation slides uh, online um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that you'll, you'll be available uh, via email if anyone with any further questions. So we have our postdoc pitches now. Uh, so we will be having two 10-minute pitches from postdocs Julia Bernardini and Joanna Kopotowska. And uh, they will then they will discuss their research um, during these pitches, uh, and then afterwards you have a chance to talk to them in a much more informal session in the in the breakout rooms, um, in the sessions tab to the left of your screen. Um, so first and foremost, I will introduce our first postdoc, um, Julia Bernardini. So Julia graduated in mathematics at the University of Pisa before obtaining her PhD in computer science from the University of Milano uh, Boc uh, Bicocca. Sorry for my pronunciation. Um, in January 2021, she joined the Life Sciences and Health Group at CWI as a postdoc researcher. The main purpose of her research is to investigate the combinatorial aspects of recent problems arising in computational biology and data sanitization. Specifically, the goal is to develop new algorithmic frameworks to de deal with pangenomic and phylogenetic data with particular attention to cancer phylogenies. So let's uh, welcome Julia onto the stage. She should be coming up just now. Excellent. Hi, Julia. Hi. Welcome. Uh, and I think the floor is yours to uh, present your research. So this is a joint work with uh, 
Paola Bonizzoni and Pavel Gavrikowski. It's about incomplete directed perfect phylogeny in linear time. So let me start by defining the main object of this work to make sure we are all on the same page. So we are given a set of species described by their states on a set of binary characters. This input is naturally encoded by a binary matrix where each entry uh, is one or zero, depending on whether that character uh, is present in that species or not. And let me also point out that this kind of object can be naturally translated into a bipartite graph where we have an edge between a species and a character, if and only if that species has that character. And I'm saying this because the method I'm going to present actually works on this bipartite graph. So what is a directed perfect phylogenetic tree for a set of species? Well, first, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the leaves of this tree and the species. It is directed if on any path from the root to a leaf, the state of each character can change from zero to one, but the opposite cannot happen. So characters can be gained, but they can never be lost. And it's perfect if the state of each character induces a connected subtree. Now, it is not true that for any binary input matrix, it is possible uh, to build uh, a directed perfect phylogenetic tree. For example, if this entry here was a one instead of the zero, this is what we would obtain if we tried to uh, build a perfect phylogenetic tree. And this is not even a tree. So in this example, depending on the state of this entry, a phylogenetic, um, perfect phylogenetic tree may or may not exist. And so, if our input has some missing data, which is a real world scenario, it makes sense to ask ourselves, is there a way to complete the missing states in such a way that the binary matrix we obtain can be explained with a directed perfect phylogenetic tree, which is the simplest model of uh, phylogeny? And this is precisely uh, the problem uh, we consider. So the input is an incomplete binary matrix. And the goal is to uh, find a perfect phylogenetic tree for a complement of this matrix, if it's possible, or to determine that no such tree exists otherwise. There exists a previous solution to this problem by Pierre et al. Uh, it runs in quasi-linear time and a lower bound on the computational time of this problem is known by gas field and it's linear in the size of the input. So the question is, can we fill this gap? Can we design an algorithm that runs in linear time in the input size? The answer is yes. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to describe how the solution by Pierre and et al. works, on which we base our solution. But the, what you need to know is that it works on the bipartite graph I showed you at first, uh, in the first slide. Um, they remove nodes from this graph and they need to maintain the connected component during this process. And this is actually the bottleneck of their algorithm. So to maintain the connected components, they make use of uh, known dynamic connectivity data structures that are very complicated, very refined. And very recently, Fernandez, Vaca and Liu showed experimentally that you, in this context, it is more effective to use simple data structures, even if the theoretical time bounds are worse. So our goal is to optimize this step of the algorithm and to design an ad hoc data structure for this problem, which is simple and which can be implemented so efficiently that we can match the lower bound on the time complexity of the incomplete directed perfect phylogeny problem. And we are able to do so because of a simple observation 
which is the operation done by the algorithm on peer and others on the graph are not general. In fact, they are very specific. We only need to remove nodes from one side of the bipartite graph. Okay, so the core of the solution is this problem. We are given a bipartite graph with character and pieces. The update operation is to remove one character. And the query is to return the connected components of uh, the remaining uh, graph. And we establish a di direct connection from the time required to perform this update and, and each query and the overall time required for the incomplete directed perfect phylogeny problem. Um, moreover, we show that it is enough to consider the symmetric, symmetric case where we have the same number of species and characters. And so this uh, picture shows conceptually uh, the structure of our data structure. So it is a binary tree. At each leaf is associated the sub graph by one character and all of the species. And each internal node corresponds to the subgraph induced by the union of the characters of its children and all of the species. So that the root is associated to the whole graph. Now, just as a side note, uh, this is not actually what we store. We don't store the, uh, the subgraphs. Instead, we store a smart and light representation of the connected components, but I will not dive into that details now due to time constraints. The nice thing about this structure is that whenever you remove a character node, this may affect the connected components of the nodes uh, on the path from that leaf to the root, but the rest of the components corresponding to the other part of the tree remain unchanged. So if we can update efficiently the nodes on this path, then we have an efficient procedure to uh, maintain the connected components with these uh, updates. And in fact, we are able to show that, that it is possible uh, to, um, to recompute the connected component of a node from the components of its children in order of n time. And if we assume that eventually we uh, remove all of the character, which is actually what happens, this means that we need O of n square log n time uh, to perform all the updates. And the query is, consists in reporting the, connect, the components of the root. So it can be done in O n time. Um, this process uh, implies, again, a quasi-linear time for IDPP, but a smarter update procedure uh, allows us to uh, uh, record an optimal time algorithm for uh, the incomplete directed perfect phylogeny problem. So in short, this is what uh, this work is about. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, our next postdoc uh, is Joanna Klobotowska, and she works as a crossover, a crossover medical specialist at the Department of Medical Informatics of Amsterdam UMC, where she combines more than 15 years of experience as a hospital pharmacist and medication safety expert with her medical informa informatics research. Her research focuses primarily on improving pharma pharmacotherapy outcomes in hospitalized patients using health informatics tools and methods such as clinical decision support systems and machine learning. So I will, let's invite uh, Joanna onto the stage. Yep. Um, Please take okay, it away. So, okay, thank you. Uh, so hi everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Joanna. Um, so my name is Joanna Klopotowska and I work as assistant uh, professor at the Department of uh, Medical Informatics at the Amsterdam um, UMC. Um, and uh, I would like to also to thank the uh, Women in Data Science community um, uh, for the opportunity to present my research uh, uh, here especially since I am not um, um, a typical uh, data scientist, uh, you, you can say, because my background is, um, is hospital pharmacy. 
Uh, however, from my experience and uh, working with my colleagues at the medical informatics uh, department, I strongly feel that being such crossover uh, specialists help us uh, to uh, faster and more uh, successfully pinpoint the problems we would like to solve in healthcare. Uh, and also, is this problem something that we can actually solve with data science uh, solutions? and uh, deliver solutions that actually uh, fulfill the needs and requirements of uh, uh, healthcare professionals and uh, patients. Uh, so today I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the research, uh, um, uh, um, ongoing research uh, towards a learning medication safety uh, uh, system. And to manage your expectations a little bit, um, uh, my talk will not contain uh, a detailed technical elaborations, but rather illustrate a highly relevant uh, healthcare problem of adverse drug events and uh, how data science uh, could play a crucial role in uh, timely detection um, and prevention of these uh, harmful events in uh, patients. So I will start with the uh, short explanation of the, um, of the healthcare problem at hand, the problem of adverse drug events. So uh, to be clear, I uh, will not, uh, I don't mean by drugs, I don't mean street drugs, but you know, the prescription drugs you can get from your general practitioner or medical uh, specialist. Um, so an adverse drug event is usually defined as uh, any harmful event resulting from drug therapy um, and uh, this type of uh, adverse events uh, are uh, the most common preventable adverse events in all settings of care. Um, and today I would like to uh, focus on the uh, hospital acquired adverse drug events uh, due to long uh, standing medications. And this type of adverse drug events have, uh, uh, has been associated with uh, prolonged uh, hospital stay, higher risk of death and higher hospital costs. And uh, the reason I focus on the long standing uh, medications uh, instead of uh, adverse drug events uh, in the context of drug discovery or adverse drug events in the context of uh, post-marketing surveillance is that 97% uh, of medicines used nowadays are medicines that have been on the market for more than 10 years. So why do these adverse drug events uh, occur? Well, first, uh, because uh, safe prescribing is challenging. Uh, as the world, world population is uh, aging, an average patient we see in the clinic usually has uh, uh, several uh, chronic diseases at the same time, also known as multimorbidity. And for that reason, these patients usually take multiple medications at the same time, also known as uh, polypharmacy. And uh, on top of this, uh, this type of high-risk patients uh, are usually excluded from randomized controlled trials um, so we often don't have a reliable insight uh, into safety of medications uh, that we prescribe uh, to these patients. And uh, second, uh, at present, we also have a limited hospital level uh, understanding of the burden and the trends in adverse drug events in uh, clinical practice. And the reason for that is that if doctors identify adverse drug events, we actually don't have one appropriate place in electronic hospital record to register those adverse drug events in a structured uh, and uh, computer interpretable manner. And uh, doctors tend to register adverse drug events in their clinical notes in an unstructured manner anyway. And also around 20% of adverse drug events are not recognized at all during uh, clinical care although the signs of adverse drug events are uh, to be found in electronic hospital record. So what is actually missing is a systematic method to routinely, rapidly and at scale uh, identify adverse drug events uh, during a hospital stay by reusing data uh, registered in electronic hospital record. And I uh, think that such a method would allow us for a timely detection of adverse drug events by clinicians in order to preclude further harm in obtaining insight in burden and trends of adverse drug events on a hospital level 
to design and implement a targeted intervention at system level and having sufficiently rich data about adverse drug events uh, would allow researchers to develop adverse drug event prognostic models to be able to prevent adverse drug events in future patients. And my inspiration for uh, such a system uh, actually comes from uh, the learning health system approach where uh, practice, data and research are connected via uh, a shared uh, technology infrastructure. So when you um, project uh, this uh, learning health system approach um, on the learning medication safety system, uh, the following components uh, need to be put in place. Of course, first, you need to uh, collect uh, data from EHR, which needs a lot of uh, work uh, in terms of legal and ethical uh, aspects. Um, second, uh, because data in EHR are observational by nature and were registered for other reasons than developing machine learning models, uh, extensive data quality and bias checks uh, are needed. Uh, furthermore, to be able to collaborate with uh, uh, professionals uh, with, in other hospitals, uh, we need to make the collected data fair, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, and to improve predictive performance uh, of the future models, the data should be semantically enriched where appropriate. Third, next to prognostic models, we really need causal ADA models, models that will provide actionable advice on what to do to reduce uh, ADA risk. Uh, fourth, um, to a certain uh, actual implementation of uh, the advices presented by the models, uh, the clinicians and patients need to understand why this advice uh, is given. Uh, this is important for trust between doctors and patients and shared decision making, uh, but also for trust between people and the computer, you could say. Uh, next, uh, the, uh, the, the systems where we uh, integrate the models in should preferably be at uh, the point of care, like in the electronic hospital record. Um, and uh, as a sixth component, we should create a machine interpretable ADA knowledge base uh, to use it to inform data-driven learning. And using this database and, uh, and the real-world data, uh, we can then uh, uh, cal calculate individual ADA risk. And finally, based on the calculated ADA risk, Personalized advice needs to be presented via a decision support system, a system which most preferably is aligned with cognitive and workflow, workflow stream uh, of its end users. And I would like to focus shortly on uh, two components of this learning medication safety system approach, which so far I found, uh, find the most um, uh, challenging. Uh, and those are the causal ADA models and uh, the uh, uh, machine interpretable ADA knowledge base. So when assessing causality of adverse drug events in, uh, in a, a clinical setting, um, there are four aspects uh, to, to be addressed. First, there is the biological plausibility, meaning is uh, the, the, the drug and event or the drug you are suspecting actually known with the mechanism of action or mechanism of toxicology that fits to the event uh, that have occurred. Then the temporal relationship where you look at the time of event and the time of drug exposure. And of course, the drug exposure needs to be before the event. Also, uh, the time between the exposure and the event can be informative to, uh, to say whether or not this drug could have caused this event and also the duration of the exposure. And uh, next, the alternative causes you have to check. So are there any uh, diseases going on or were there any procedures applied that could also explain the event? 
and not just a drug. And lastly, uh, the strength of association, which can be tasted, uh, tested uh, twofold. Uh, first, by the challenge, meaning you stop the drug you think is causing the event, and you see if the event is uh, resolved. And re-challenge means that you actually restart this drug again and see if the event is uh, coming back. You can imagine that re-challenge is rarely applied in the clinical practice. And once you've done this whole causality assessment, uh, at the end, you will get an answer uh, on the level of certain, nearly certain, uh, probable, possible, unlikely, of even sometimes unaccessible. So when developing causal uh, ADA models, I think this uh, aspect should ideally be addressed and provide uh, a confidence with which the causal link has been identified. Uh, furthermore, uh, this approach clearly demonstrates uh, the need of having a computer interpretable ADA knowledge base, which includes knowledge about, among others, mechanism of action and mechanism of toxicology of the drugs and diseases. And uh, unfortunately, um, this, uh, the evidence base uh, about adverse drug events is often trapped in either a PDF documents that can be difficult to parse into structured uh, fields and, uh, or is available on websites but also not in a structured format. Therefore, translating this knowledge into machine-readable, uh, uh, but even more so in machine-interpretable data format, is needed. Having such a machine-interpretable ADA knowledge base uh, would allow us to inform learning based on data with evidence-based uh, knowledge. Uh, it has been postulated that knowledge representation might play both a historical and foundational role in application of machine learning in healthcare, providing a common cognitive layer. So eventually, I hope that this learning medication safety system with all its components will gradually result in uh, benefits on different levels, from patients who will suffer less from adverse drug events to healthcare insurers uh, uh, who will uh, be enabled uh, to establish more uh, value-based pricing because uh, they better know what is the actual effectiveness of drugs in daily practice. And to close my presentation, the development of the learning medication safety, uh, safety system is part of the uh, pharmacoinformatics lab, uh, where together with uh, colleagues from my department and outside of my department, uh, I aim at optimizing pharmacotherapeutic patient care and pharmacotherapy outcomes uh, via methods and tools from the field of medical informatics. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and please don't hesitate to email me and I hope to see many of you in the breakout uh, rooms soon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the last part of WIDS Amsterdam. So I hope you've all had a nice little break. And we will now be hearing from our industry keynote speaker, Lydia Menes. So Lydia has a master's in artificial intelligence from the University of Amsterdam. And she joined CTQ in 2015 when it was just a startup of consisting of consi and consisting of only five people. Since then, she's uh, been currently helping to continue perfecting CTQ's context classification model, which determines the relevance of medical concepts and text and works towards the normalization of data in snow med codes. Given the amount of research and available meetups on the topic, one would expect Dutch hospitals to be bursting with AI, yet many well-performing initiatives never make it to the clinical setting. Why is this so difficult and how can we pave the way for future applications? Maybe we'll be addressing these questions from an industry perspective in her presentation. I'd like to remind you all that you can ask any questions in the Q&A function if you look at the right-hand side of your screen and then the stage tab and then just underneath Q&A. 
Um, but for now, please welcome Lydia onto the stage. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, Dion, thank you, thank you for uh, having me and uh, introducing me so well. Uh, yeah, I made the title, What Does It Take to Make AI Fly in the Clinical Setting? Because um, uh, as Clarissa also pointed out, uh, you, you, there is a lot of research and also a lot of uh, outcomes that look very promising. And yet in the actual clinical setting, um, there, uh, yeah, there's not that much being made use of so far. Uh, Clarissa pointed out uh, a number of the reasons for that, and I'm going to um, add another one to that. Uh, so yeah, CTQ, this is uh, the company that I work for. We have a uh, search engine. Uh, so we use both uh, structured data and uh, natural language processing on uh, all the notes that are available in uh, health records um, to enable people within hospitals uh, to construct reliable data sets. So this search engine is uh, yeah, part of the hospital uh, infrastructure. Data never leaves the hospital. Um, as you can imagine, if, you, if you've worked on such a product for uh, five years, then uh, me and my colleagues, we have seen uh, the ins and outs of uh, hospital data. And uh, yeah, that is the background from which uh, I will be giving this talk. So um, I think this, when it comes to an industry talk versus an academic talk, uh, I think these are three points that most people would uh, uh, agree on if they have a bit of an uh, AI uh, background. Um, I think AI definitely has the capacity to improve healthcare and that one of the strengths is that it can take into account uh, much more information than uh, a doctor ever could. Uh, they cannot read your entire medical file every time they see you, every time they make a decision. But in principle, uh, yeah, an AI with the proper data uh, would be able to always take everything into account. And um, that data quality is key. But then when it comes to the day-to-day -day, uh, work, I think there is a bit of a difference between working in industry or in academia. Um, when, when I look up papers on, on, uh, uh, yeah, medical NLP or, or, uh, models applied in healthcare, um, yeah, there's always a focus on, on becoming that state of the art of having the best performing model. Um, the use of data sets is, uh, often standard such that you can compare well the performance, uh, and these kind of things. Well, when you're trying to actually have a product in uh, in the uh, yeah in practice, then it becomes impossible to ignore practicalities. Uh, the cases that are less functioning, you need to somehow facilitate that that they are part of it anyway. Uh, there's a lot of data to process. Uh, how do you let users interact? Uh, like all these these kind of day to day focuses. Uh, yeah, I had one thing that I wanted to ask from uh, the people uh, who are uh, watching right now. And uh, that is, uh, at the end of last year, Google presented their medical natural language processing solution. Um, it's, it's not the first one around. Amazon also uh, presented one. And uh, I would like to ask, you guys, if you think you should be, that we should be using it in practice, like should we be sending our actual medical records uh, to one of these solutions? You can just uh, let it know in the chat or anything. I'm uh, gonna continue my presentation and uh, then I would like to have a look after the talk. So I think the easiest in practice, although uh, yeah, Clarissa also pointed out the, the difficulties with uh, image analysis, uh, in her talk, I do think image analysis is one of the easiest one. It is, um, the images are stored somewhere in a hospital. They are relatively, um, yeah, easy to extract because they're not uh, uh, distributed according uh, over, over the entire electronic healthcare records. So this is, this is also where the more successful applications 
uh, that are currently in practice uh, are mainly in this area. Because once you start looking at uh, other applications, so then, uh, yeah, we can think of indeed diagnosis support or um, the adverse drug events that were mentioned by uh, Joanna earlier, then uh, you're going to need more information. Uh, the medical history, like what other diagnosis have people had either in the past or chronically ongoing, uh, what kind of symptoms have they reported now, and if it's a longer running issue, maybe also further back into, uh, uh, into their history, what kind of measurements, what kind of medication uh, are they using, anything might might become relevant uh especially when you when you want to make use of the advantage of ai that it can uh, take into account all this information so when you have these kind of models what will keep those from being implemented in practice um i call it the data gap uh, and by that i mean the difference between uh, a data set that has been extracted with uh, from the EHR, uh, often with, uh, with great effort. Uh, but once you want to start running uh, a model in practice, uh, you will need to be able to feed it the same quality of data. And the reason for this is that let's imagine that you have a perfect uh diagnostic support tool it will uh, recommend excellent uh diagnosis and reduce the time that it takes to uh, get to the correct one by a lot if you put it into practice and you feed it data of a different quality then your outcomes are uh, going to deteriorate uh, rather quickly so why does your data set not exist like that well First of all, data is, uh, at least in the Netherlands, I don't know if other countries also still have it as much, um, but data is still stored in different places. I asked uh, my colleague from, uh, who is more working with uh, structured uh, data for some examples, and uh, the one I picked to share here is for instance, medication. If you get medication on, uh intensive care it is stored separately from uh the regular ehr the same goes for uh the pharmacists they often have a separate system so you might write into the ehr that you have prescribed something but that prescription is sent to the pharmacist and then it is registered registered there uh, for instance that a patient did never picked up those medication and therefore has not been taking them these kind of um, uh, things happen with the data and they definitely need to be taken into account when you wanna uh, implement models in practice. So data stored in different formats uh, of which a very big one is text, which is what I focus mainly on. Um, it's not that there are no structured diagnoses present in EHRs. Um, and also not that they are not being used more and more, but you will always find additional diagnosis in text. Um, this can be because uh, it's either from the past and people just uh, mentioned that they have, uh, have had a heart attack five years ago and it is uh, only registered there. Um, or if people move and switch hospitals or they go somewhere uh, for a specific treatment, um, then the, uh, the additional diagnoses are often still recorded in text. Um, a different way of having text, but uh, a little different are forms. It's a little bit more structured given that you have a question and an answer. Uh, sometimes those answers are multiple choice uh, or text fields, but at least you know a bit better what is uh, recorded in there. Uh, however, these forms are, for instance, customizable between hospitals. If I have a model that needs to know, uh, yeah, needs to know some of the information that is recorded in, 
in these forms and I have that up and running in one hospital, that doesn't mean it's going to work in a different hospital. You might either ruin your data quality or uh, yeah, not get the data at all. Another thing, and this is, uh, this one you cannot that easily solve. Uh, solve because it's hard to uh, find out afterwards what is actually true. Sometimes there are inconsistencies between between the structured data. Uh, I have an example here, but also between uh, uh, text and um, uh, and the structured data. So, for instance, again, this is a real life example that uh, my colleagues have encountered. Is uh, when it comes to the medication table in the electronic healthcare re record you have a variable that says administers, uh, administrate, administered, uh, which can have a value of one or zero, either that was done or not. And it has a status. So what if these um, contradict each other? The status is planned and the administered date uh, uh, has the variable of one, then what is the truth? You cannot easily uh, uh, figure this out afterwards. Um, so something I wanted to mention here, there is a project called Odyssey, O-H-D-S-I, as I uh, noted below in the slide. Um, this is something that we've uh, looked at. It is a proposal by the uh, scientific community of how you could um, organize and, and store uh, medical data such that, uh, yeah, value-based healthcare or machine learning initiatives that they can uh, all use these uh, Odyssey databases. And um, yeah, then we take away a lot of the this, this work. But for instance, uh, when our team started looking into that, like how can we use this? How could we maybe apply that? When you have these kind of inconsistencies, um, their rough approach is to simply ignore this data. But that is something that in practice, when you have a patient in front of you that has inconsistent data in their uh, medical record, obviously you cannot just, just ignore this patient in front of you or ignore the medication entirely, or like somehow you will need to have to deal with this. So sometimes also difficult is that data is stored abundantly. It is not uncommon um, for something where you think, okay, but this should have happened at one point in time, that it has uh, about five or six dates uh, attached to it. So then which one uh, should, should you be using? What is uh, most likely the, the truth of, of what you're actually uh, intending to measure? And something that I think will be uh, carrying uh, forever is that uh, data is stored at different times. Um, sometimes hospitals switch from EHR systems. Uh, that has happened a lot in the last uh, recent years because there were uh, a lot of EHRs in the market. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that is more converting uh, yeah, to the big ones, I would say. But uh, for instance, we have seen that when uh, changing EHRs, that all the dates of reports became the conversion dates. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're not aware of this and think that all these reports were actually from that conversion date, then you all of a sudden get a ton of data that seems to have happened in a different point of time. What also changes over time, and I think this will be forever this way, is that um, the way the information is stored in an EHR changes over time. Um, for, is, for instance, if you wanna split up a structured field into, uh, because you wanna record it more uh, refinedly, then uh, it's impossible to do this backwards. Um, yet your model might have a need for these different types of information for it to be, uh, yeah, for it to be complete. So, um, slightly different uh, take, I guess, on this uh, on this same issue, which is like, what what do you run into uh, when you want to use things in practice? Um, 
So the 31st of March, that's only a few days ago, NICTIS, that is a, um, uh, an organization that uh, tries to promote uh, share, being able to share knowledge and um, when it comes to healthcare. And uh, they said that they are finally hit a uh, hit the finish line of a project to translate SNOMAP, to actually uh, translate all of the medical concepts that are in there, or almost all of them, um, to Dutch, including synonyms. Um, yeah, I've been uh, working on and off with uh, SNOMAD, um, and I still want to quickly show this. Um, so the uh, this is the concept, uh, according to SNOMAD, from the for a myocardial infarction, and um, uh, at the top you see the three Dutch uh, synonyms that uh, has been provided by uh, Nictis. Uh, of which the first one is ambiguous. This can mean a, mi uh, a number of things. And when I look at our own synonym set, when it comes to myocardial infarction, uh, we also add, uh, yeah, a lot of additional ones. And all of these, when they actually occur in text, uh, that will mean a uh, myocardial infarction. So then you might wonder, uh, these synonyms, are they not part of uh, a different SNOMED concept? And that is true. Uh, if you look here to the top right, you see a parent myocard infarct. Then we see here an acute myocard infarct as the concept. And the whole list below, uh, where uh, in those, those synonyms that I just sh uh, showed, some of those are, are stored there, at least as partial things. But here it has to be acute. And uh, none of the synonyms that are mentioned in this ontology will actually occur like that in text. That will look like the ones I was showing here before. They will speak about an anterolateral infarct. So, um, yeah, what is unfortunate about, about this, this lack of um, link between actual language, the way people write it down, and, uh, and these kind of tools is that it is very difficult to um, automatically create a lot of samples. Um, and uh, those kind of automatically generated samples can be a good tool uh, for pre-training models. Um, so yeah, it's another thing that you run into and this, this problem is significantly worse for uh, yeah, tinier languages such as Dutch compared to uh, English, where the resources are uh, far more elaborate. So what would be possible ways of um, crossing this data gap that I've been mentioning? I've just uh, listed three here. I think uh, we could think of a few more if we wanted to. Um, but one is, and people are putting effort in this, what if all data was just registered better and more structured? Um, personally, I think doctors already complain a lot about the time needed for registration. Uh, the more you force to make it uh, drop down forms and, and uh, very extensive questions, which might not at all apply to this patient. Um, I think we're, we're then putting the burden with people who have should have other priorities. Doctors should care for the patients and not so much worry about the secondary purposes of the data that they are entering. Also, um, clinical practitioners always need text to communicate in nuance. Uh, when it comes to differential diagnosis, what are they thinking of right now? What should be uh, watched out for with this uh, person? Um, all these kind of things you will, uh, yeah, is often communicated in text. Also the adverse drug events. Uh, mentioned before by Joanna, that's also a, a known one to us that it's uh, mainly recorded in text. Um, and there is definitely room for improvement. Um, some people think punctuation is, uh, is uh, just for fun and that B backslash is a very clear title when you're talking about, for instance, um, what you plan to do, beleid, policy. Um, and then you're talking about events that you are planning to do, but which might never actually happen. So um, there is 
there is a lot of room for, for improvement, but I don't think this is the way to go to make the data ready for secondary purposes. So we could all be learning from raw messy data. Um, that means that for any application, um, so for instance, the, uh, yeah, do you want to give me an excellent example? Um, so in these adverse drug events, for instance, um, you can use NLP tools to, uh, to start extracting these adverse drug events specifically for your uh, monitoring platform. But this means that for every uh, specific purpose model, um, they will require ac these actual forms, uh, these letters that contain all kinds of information, included information. And I'm not necessarily talking about names, but also, I don't know, how they experience uh, their diagnosis, um, all these kind of things. Um, so I, I think that's a, a downside to have everyone for every person uh, or for every purpose learn from the raw messy data. Um, also, it means that every initiative will need to spend time and uh, an effort on how to use this raw data, uh, how to do NLP, how to extract the information that you actually need. So um, I do think this is this is a, would be a valid solution, but it's not my favorite. Um, so this is my uh, would be my pick, and that is to spread the work between AI that um, uh, does the electronic health court transformation and interpretation. So you try to out of out of this clinically collected data build. Um, an abstract model of a patient with all the medication usage and uh, adverse drug events, and uh, but in a uh, yeah more structured and extracted way, and then you have AI that can use all this information uh, to improve outcomes, to check for rare diseases, to whatever cool application of AI in the healthcare domain you can think of. Um, partially, this is already happening. Um, collaborating hospitals, for instance, create uh, specialized data lakes um, uh, to both train and evaluate, and then hopefully in a later stage also um, put into practice um, machine learning models. Uh, however, they do tend to be rather specialized. Uh, focused on one specialism, I'm not sure how much they take into account the information stored in other parts of the EHR and how long back that goes. So if we were to want to do this, what do then the basics of this EHR text processing look like? Uh, yeah, not, <laughs> not surprisingly, these are also uh, uh, the tasks that uh, uh, I've worked on a lot in the last years. So the first one is to find uh, medical concepts in text. What are diagnoses? Uh, in this example, we only see diagnoses. Um, but it's like, which ones are the actual medical concepts? Uh, could also be procedures or medication. Then a different step is in what context are they mentioned? Uh, is it uh, related to the patient? Is it uh, negated? Is it family history? Is it uh, a generic mention? For instance, when you say a uh, uh, patient might be eligible to a study of this medication, but that doesn't mean a patient is taking it at all. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely required uh, after you find medical concepts because uh, without this, you won't be uh, able to properly interpret them. When did something happen? Also an important thing. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, very, very often it is mentioned in text when, uh, 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 when things happened and you need to be able to uh, extract it uh, link it up to the correct concept and um, uh, and actually making uh, the temporal information uh, 
machine readable, so structure it. Uh, then you get a little bit uh, less basic, I call it here. Um, often, around all these diagnoses, there are a ton of attributes. Uh, so for instance, uh, here I have severity, but uh, for instance with cancer, what type it is, uh, all kinds of severity classes. Um, and uh, so attributes make up a large part of the actual text data. And if you wanna go beyond just the concepts, so yeah, a large part is attributes. And if you wanna extract the information correctly, uh, you will need to take them out. And then for, um, For proper use of uh, the EHR data and text, um, but also structured, uh, at some point you need to normalize the concepts. Uh, this, uh, without this, it is very difficult to put any model in practice across hospitals because there are variations in how they write it down, both structured and unstructured, um, or semi-structured in the forms. So at some point you need to find common ground on what is what. Um, this is uh, a rather difficult task. Um, also because you're limited in the number of uh, labels. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's a difficult task and uh, I'm uh, very uh, curious uh, how well, for instance, the, the, the actual Google NLP for Dutch text would, would work in an actual hospital setting at uh, adding these codes. They, they claim they're very good at it. So, um, apart from what we need to be doing to cross this data cap, it is also worth uh, mentioning that uh, have, having worked with medical data for five years now, you can actually see the data improving over time, uh, the, both the, the quality of the structured data and uh, the notes. It is, uh, if it's from this year, it is significantly better than if it's from like three, four years ago. Um, unfortunately, it is good to remember that uh, an actual medical history can span decades. That is well before any EHR was ever there and a hospital might have um, four versions of an EHR in uh, a few decades, but that is actually the span of medical history. So whatever is recorded now as it is, um, yeah, we'll still be dealing with that for, uh, for quite a while if we wanna actually take it into account. So what would I need you, like you to take home from this um, is that this, this data gap, in order to smoothly be able uh, to roll out AI applications, this data gap needs to maybe not be solved, but at least be reduced by a lot. If everyone who has something cool to offer needs to go through the entire process of validating that they are actually getting the data that they trained on, um, I think that will slow things down tremendously. However, if you actually solve the data gap, it might become as easy as uh, a medical app store if you have normalized data. Um, yeah, and I do think it's uh, it's cool to imagine that, that hospitals could easily uh, uh, check out different uh, models, try it out in, in their own settings, uh, check if the claims about the model hold in their, their hospital. Um, the less work that becomes, the more uh, the more likely that they are that they will actually uh, take the effort to do so. And uh, that was my uh, closing remark. Oh, remarkably nicely timed. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for your excellent talk again. Um, we have a, a fair few questions coming through. Uh, so I'd just like to remind everyone that they can ask their questions uh, on the right hand side where it says stage and then Q&A. Uh, but first, I'd actually like to ask you what you think, whether we should be sharing our data with Google or, or the likes of, of Amazon as well, um, as you are. Well, obviously, I'm the competition, so in that sense, it would already be no. But the answer would also be no, because I think, uh, because of incentive. 
uh, specialized companies don't have incentive to link up your medical data to other data. Mm -hmm. uh, where I think Google and Amazon do have an incentive and the only way, the only thing that stands in between them actually doing it or not doing it is, is a promise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think it's a bit weak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, there's a fair few people in, in the chat who, who agree with your point of view there. Um, so we, we have a first question from Julia. Um, and she asks, uh, is there enough awareness or active campaigning for doctors that their notes can be extremely valuable for AI? So do they know or understand the impact that they can make to train better AI models? Um, I think it's starting to dawn. And uh, something that is, that is cool about the system that we built, because it is actually also uh, usable by clinicians, and all of a sudden they, can, uh, they get their own data fed back to them. Yeah. It can be quite effective. Uh, we know so of some teams where certain doctors all of a sudden started uh, registrating a lot better because they could actually reuse their own data to get insights. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's would be very de definitely a good incentive for them. Um, yeah, so we have another question from Chianti. Um, data is in nature a recording of the past. The current healthcare system knows severe forms of bias, like race or gender bias. Yeah. Do you have an idea on how to uh, deal with such biases? Um, yeah, that I do find that very difficult, and it's it's not my specialization, so I wouldn't want to make any any claims on it. Um, uh, but I did recently have with a colleague of mine a rather uh, interesting discussion. We were thinking, like, uh, for instance, uh, ethnicity. Should you, uh, uh, if it's if it's part of your data, um, it can be. Um, uh, relevant medically wise so in our yeah. data sets it it is often uh yeah in the data it can be present so should you be using this to uh, to encode certain things and should you do that implicitly like it might happen implicitly so you might as well do it explicitly and if you only change the ethnicity uh of a certain prediction and the outcome changes uh, then you might have to conclude that your model has has bias there. And we were thinking that that might be an effective way to deal with it, to actually run predictions twice and, and flag and only flip those variables that uh, that are known to yeah. be biased and then take it from there. But that that's a thought it is really not my area of expertise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question from Joanna, um, and she asks, which libraries slash ontologies do you use to extract medical concepts and their attributes from Dutch clinical text? Um, uh, so the library I use is, is, is our own trained models. Uh, that, that is, uh, yeah, that is uh, part of our um, uh, IP. And... Um, uh, but for for tr for training those models, it is uh, yeah like anyone uh, SK Learn uh, the the yeah PyTorch any training uh, facilities that you can find online um, and uh, there was a second part of the question. What was it again? Uh, oh, the uh, ontologies. Yeah, on the ontology. So we used UMLS in the past because it has the most terms in them. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's also very messy. Uh, we're in the process of moving to Snowmed um, because I have I do have the feeling that internationally and definitely in the Netherlands it is converting to be the ontology of of use, mm -hmm. and many other ones like ICD-10 and stuff can be uh, referred from it or in interpreted. Like you can switch between. Them. Yeah. And actually, do you see very many differences across different regions in the Netherlands based on on the the, the raw data that you get? Um, you know, do some regions or hospitals uh, um, structure their data in a much better way, or is it you know pretty? Yeah, and and uh, there there are massive differences, okay. and uh, it can. Uh, uh, some hospitals are running with a rather old EHR that mm -hmm. uh, it's really converging to these two EHR suppliers. The smaller ones, yeah, many of them have, have uh, switched in the last couple of years. Um, so, so it's really a difference between EHRs, but uh, also just habit of within the hospitals. Um, yeah, there are massive differences. Yeah. 
we have another question from Ariel. And she asks, uh, do EHR platforms in the market converge to uh, less than or equal to three big names? Or do we see the trend? Because if it does, the job is mostly technical to get old data right. Otherwise, we need to innovate for transformation. Um, so it is, it is, it definitely looks to be converging. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but these EHR suppliers are also kept rather busy in the sense that, um, for instance, they need to be able to comply that you, uh, like when, when there come out, comes out new regulation that they will need to be complying to, then that is where they, they tend to put their efforts. And um, also, given how much it costs, uh, both in money and in effort for hospitals to implement an EHR, uh, once they have it, they're going to be stuck with it for a while. And that does, I do have a strong feeling that that dampens uh, uh, yeah, their drive to, to, to innovate. Mm. Yeah. Um, I see the time, so we're, we're just coming up to the, the end. If anyone has any last minute questions, please ask them now. Um, otherwise, I would very much like to thank you, Lydia, for your excellent talk. Uh, as with um, the other presentations, we will be sharing your presentation uh, on the WIDS website um, and uh, on the ADS website as well. Um, so people can either contact you directly, I think via your presentation, it had your email address, um, if they have any further questions or, or collaborations. Um, and uh, yes, but thank you so much for, for your presentation today. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, uh, having me. And uh, yeah, thanks for the participants as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we uh, have come to the end of today's event. Um, I would very much like to thank our inspiring speakers, um, the entire WIDS team, uh, so not just the Amsterdam team, but the, the Netherlands team as well, who gave us a lot of support. Um, our sponsor, the University of Amsterdam, through their Grassroots Sites for All grant. Um, and uh, of course, our supporting organizations, uh, so Amsterdam Data Science, Amsterdam Medical Data Science, and Smart Health Amsterdam. And last but of course, not least, we would like to thank you, our audience, for participating in today's event. We really hope that you enjoyed it, and uh, we hope to see you here again in a year's time, I hope. Um, and we really hope that you have enjoyed today's event. Um, but for now, I think that's, that's everything from us. So thank you so much once more, and uh, enjoy the networking. <laughs>